to today's senior speeches. Our first speaker today is Carter Latham. Carter will be introduced by Mr. Stain. Good morning. The date was February 13th, 2023. We were deep into the series of one act plays well known to many of the juniors and seniors here as the Kentucky Cycle. <laughs> I wasn't expecting anything in particular to happen this day, but since it was nearing Valentine's Day, perhaps a song was in my future. Little did I know that that song that would steal my heart would come from a rather spindly siren named Carter Latham. <laughs> As we were reading the play out loud, we reached, we reached a song, and a song in support of the Union. While I'd always hoped someone might break into song, I never expected it would actually happen. And then it did. The grovelly sound of Carter singing in support of the Union I can still remember the joy that this produced in the class, the laughter that almost sent Ainsley sprawling from her chair, and the quick mind of Caroline to get it all on camera for posterity to enjoy. Uh, swing by if you ever want to check it out. It's one of my favorite moments teaching ever. When I think of Carter, I think of him popping up out of nowhere to say hello and bring joy to my day. I think of the team at Mercy accidentally leaving his name on the buzzer system as The Table, and that became his nickname for the rest of that season. Um, I think of the first time I met him and he wouldn't look me in the eye. Uh, I think of the force of nature he has become in the world of quick recall. I think of victory, I think of kindness, I think of laughter, and I think of friendship. While things will change when Carter graduates, I will always remember the song that Carter sang that day and will always remember what Carter has meant to my life. I give you Carter Latham. If someone asked me to describe myself, I would have a remarkably hard time doing so. But based on how others have described me, I am silly, energetic, funny, as light as a feather, and perhaps a bit of a cutie. I agree with all of this. However, people also describe me as smart. Now, I can see how people might think I'm decent at math, but for my entire life, I've been baffled by this notion of me being smart because I know that if the times were different, natural selection would have quickly taken action and ensured that the bloodline ended with me. <laughs> if a higher power exists, they must have been hammered at the time of my creation because there were some pretty obvious oversights. Why am I able to understand Mr. Stern's ramblings in multivariable calculus, and where do all those hard-working brain cells go whenever I try to order a vanilla iced law from Fontes. What about when I can't follow simple instructions or when I can't find an object in plain sight, even if someone points directly at it? Of course, everybody has their strengths and weaknesses, but I would still love to see what my brain activity looks like compared to other people's when I am performing simple, everyday tasks because sometimes it genuinely feels like a crucial part of my brain is missing. At the young age of seven, I was in Washington, D.C. with some family. We had parked on the right side of a rather busy road, and I was on the left side of the back seat playing Mario Kart on my Nintendo DS. Upon realizing we had reached our destination, I nonchalantly opened the left door and began to exit the vehicle, much to the discontent of my family and the bus that was barreling towards me. <laughs> Without my attentive family members, the bus would have transferred some of its kinetic energy to me and, well, I would have died. <laughs> Fortunately, however, my family promptly alerted me of my mistake by grabbing me and pulling me back in the car. So against all odds, I did manage to live past the age of seven. Perhaps in another universe, I would have learned from this experience and understood that I need to pay more attention to my surroundings. But in this universe, the message did not stick, and all I could do was be bewildered how people found it so easy to never accidentally walk into oncoming traffic. Becoming aware of my surroundings is a skill I have yet to develop, which I know because I still always get lost whenever I use the bathroom in an unfamiliar building. <laughs> As stated earlier, everyone has their strengths and weaknesses, but it takes time to figure out what those are. For example, in elementary school, you might not know what you're good or bad at yet, but your parents will likely recommend or enroll you in some activities they think you might be good at or enjoy. Now the easy go-to sport is running. I mean, all kids run around, it's what they do. So in third grade, I was told I would be running cross country. 
I ended up getting last place in a fairly large meet, crossing the finish line a solid minute and a half after the guy who was second to last. <laughs> There's no real story to this one, I literally just sucked at running. However, all hope was not lost just yet. I was also quite tall for my age, so there's always basketball, right? <laughs> Not necessarily. Truth be told, I sucked. As everyone knows, for every additional inch you are above the average height, you become twice as good at basketball. Unfortunately for me, zero times anything is still zero. <laughs> it wasn't that I couldn't aim or shoot, ride or run, because looking back, I could do all three of those things, at least, kinda. So I'm not sure how I managed to go the entire season without making a single basket during matches, but it might have something to do with the fact that I was honestly quite scared of the other players. I could have dribbled that ball all day if I was the only one on the court, but unfortunately, when there were other people on the court with goals different from my own, I got scared and lost the ball. To this day, I'm not sure why I was so intimidated by them. I knew they weren't going to jump me after the match if I scored on them, yet I couldn't bring myself to even try and overcome their defensive measures. I clearly wasn't scared of getting hit by a bus, so I'm not sure what I found so terrifying about nine-year-olds in basketball jerseys, but I suspect it had something to do with confidence, as I faced similar issues when playing quick recall in middle school. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with Quick Recall, you answer questions with a buzzer to get points for your team, and the team with the most points at the end wins. When I first started playing, I refused to play in matches because I thought it would be too stressful. Even in practice, if I thought I knew the answer, even if I knew I knew the answer, I wouldn't buzz. I was scared of getting it wrong, which doesn't make sense because nobody cares, especially during practice, and there isn't even a penalty for wrong answers. Yeah, I'm not sure when I figured out how to stop being such a dumb bimbo, but I'm proud to say that I am now a contributing member of the Varsity Quick Recall team who can answer math questions with stunning speed and accuracy. I still have yet to woo any Quick Recall girls with my mathematical prowess, but that's just because they're scared of me. You haven't seen testosterone until you've seen me with a buzzer, a pencil, and some paper. I could tell more stories, but I think I've succeeded at embarrassing myself. I was drawn to this topic because Caroline Sorgel suggested it, and she's smart, so I decided to just do what she said. But the truth of the matter is, I don't take myself very seriously. I prefer it this way. Perhaps I would be a better or smarter individual if I was always seeking answers, analyzing everything, and taking everything seriously, but I've always preferred to only use my brain about 30% of the time. It's just more fun that way, even though it's led me to make unconventional choices, such as the time when I was sitting outside at lunch with my friends last year and randomly got the urge to jump out of my seat and run headfirst into one of those big, hard cylindrical supports that you probably walk past on your way here. <laughs> It hurt a lot, but I'm not too worried about brain damage because I clearly already had some. I could have written a profound, meaningful, life-altering speech instead of whatever this is, but I'm not sure such a speech would reflect the true nature of my character. I'm not a very serious guy, so I'm not writing a very serious speech. The only advice I can give you is don't tell a person that they should play basketball just because they are tall, especially if they're good at math. <laughs> if you're seeking answers to important questions, hopefully Abby or Brooks will have something for you, and if they don't, there's always next Thursday. Regardless, thank you for listening to my senior speech, and I'll see you all later. Our second speaker today is Abby Meldrum. Abby will be introduced by her sister, Emmy. When Abby asked me to introduce her, I was honored, even though I was pretty much certain I would be doing so already. I mean, it only made sense. Abby and I have been a pair since I was born. We watched cartoons together, played together, ate together. Honestly, pretty much every memory I have from when I was young features Abby. Even when we fought, we didn't really fight. Nothing sums up our relationship better than this letter Abby wrote to me when I wanted to play with her too much. Dear Emmy, I'm sorry that I don't play with you that often. I don't play with you because you are more of a pretend player, and I'm more of a natural player. And I usually think of some other thing I could be doing, and I feel like I'm wasting my time, and I'm more of an alone girl. <laughs> but here are games I like to play. Card games, beauty salon, 
clubs, scavenger hunts, and hide and seek, also gymnastics. So when you want to play, my answer is most likely yes, if you ask to play one of these games. But sometimes it will be no, and that just means I want alone time, okay? Love, Abby. <laughs> Despite the super mean and really, cool letter, really cruel letter she wrote to me, I love Abby more than anything. She's not just my sister, but my best friend. I'll miss you when you go to college, and I'm so grateful for everything you've done for me. Uh, even if it meant putting up with our different playing styles. With that, I would like to introduce you to my sister, Abby. When I began the college process, Ms. Prince asked me what I most value. I thought back to my last 12 years and realized that one constant was how much I value community and connections in my life. For example, in fifth grade at Collegiate, Ms. Beck assigned a timeline project where we predicted events in our future and described milestones of our past. My timeline began in 1945 and concluded in the year 2101. Although I did not make many crazy predictions for myself, I did care so much about my friends that I imagined their futures along with my own. I wrote that I would have five pets over the years, and with each one, even when I turned 70, I would bring them to Thea Nagel's vet clinic to get spayed. I also predicted that Charlotte Kahn would become the first female president, and that Ellen McGuire and Rachel Disney would, quote, score some spectacular baskets in women's basketball. And I made sure to include in my timeline that in 2036, I would donate precisely 30 gallons of water to Africa. I didn't quite grasp the concept of how little 30 gallons of water would be <laughs> for an entire continent. But I've known I've cared about connections and caring for others since a very young age. So in response to Ms. Prince's college question, I told her that I love rain. I know this may seem like a strange answer to the question of what I value, but bear with me. She told me that loving rain meant that I was a pluviophile. A pluviophile is a person who enjoys rain in rainy days and who is fascinated by the sights and sounds of rain. When reflecting on the idea of going to college somewhere that was rainy, I realized that I don't only love rain because of its beauty and sound. I love rain because rain has played a role in most of my memories that involve strong community building moments. When I hear the familiar pitter patter of rain, I feel a deep sense of comfort. While others may see rain as an inconvenience, no matter where I am, my excitement builds when I smell the earthy scent of oncoming rain. When it rains in the mountains, it pours. Every summer for the past seven years, Keystone Camp in Brevard, North Carolina has been my favorite second home. At camp, it often rains so intensely that a weather alarm goes off, canceling activities and forcing us to shelter inside. Every time I hear the screeching noise of the alarm, I know we will be gathering in our cabins for a few hours of fun. I was 11, talking with another camper when I heard the sound of the high-pitched alarm. We were alone in our cabin when a counselor found us. As the rain started spraying through the mesh windows, we laughed as we scrambled to take the mattresses off the top bunks to keep them dry. Even though I was not nervous about the storm, the counselor helped me find the delight in the moment. I was grateful that her presence allowed us to have fun and feel safe. She patiently listened while I showed her every single picture that I had from home. I then explained, at length, the names and relationships of all 17 of my stuffed animal foxes. Her kindness made my 11-year-old self feel very respected. On this joyful and rainy day, I found comfort in my home away from home. I was 14, running around and preparing for Keystone's planned outdoor evening program when the raindrops began to splash down. As we went inside, I realized what we would do instead, movie, movie night. Everyone put pajamas on, got popcorn with M&Ms, and sat together to watch The Parent Trap, the Lindsay Lohan version, of course. While my friends, who had practically become sisters over the years, braided my hair, I was reminded of how special this community was. The weather did not ruin what turned out to be a perfect camp moment, watching a movie late into the night while the sound of pouring rain served as a beautiful background. I was 17 and looking forward to my first summer as a camp counselor. My anticipation built as parents began to drop off their campers. After the goodbyes, I brought my seven-year-old girls up to our cabin. <coughs> the rain began to fall. I recognized the worry on their faces, so I explained that the rain shower was harmless and could even be fun. Thankfully, the adjustment was quick. In no time, the girls began to joyfully skip along, giggling at the raindrops sprinkling on their heads. Two weeks later, it was the end of the session. For a fun final night, we dressed up some of the horses as unicorns and brought them around camp. As the girls began to fall asleep, one of them told me that she was scared of how the thunder sounded. I explained to her not to worry, but to instead imagine that the unicorns we had seen earlier that night were having a party in the clouds. She smiled and rolled over to fall asleep. At this moment, I realized the opportunity I had been given. 
I could teach my girls to find the whimsy in these rainy moments of life, whether that be literal or metaphorical, just as my past counselors had done for me. This full circle moment was not lost on me. Would these connections have occurred on a sunny day? Perhaps. However, rain brings pause and an opportunity to pivot. It creates a choice to focus on canceled plans or to discover new beautiful bonding moments together. My rainy days have created an opportunity for joy even in the most unexpected times. Every day I wake up knowing that whether it's sunny or raining, I can foster community with those around me. Whether I am playing cards sheltered from a rainstorm, dancing on soaked tennis courts with my friends, running through the rain out the backstage exit to get to the other side of the stage with my theater friends in sequin dresses and heels, or laughing with my parents in the rain while trying to keep my sister's birthday gifts dry, I cherish these rain or shine connections with my friends and family. Like many others in this room, my schedule is packed full. All of my communities when I'm at home in Kentucky and not in the mountains teach me different values that have helped me become the woman I am today. One of the reasons why I am so grateful for the people who feel like home to me is because they are groups I know I can rely on for support when I need it. In my turbulent mental health journey, having people and groups that I can share both up and down moments with has become quite important. The connections in my life strengthen and comfort me. Over the last 12 years, Collegiate has been a constant community of people I can rely on. In any rainy moments of my time here, I have been able to find the fun and enjoyable parts that make this community stand out. There was the long list of extra credit projects I did in first grade for no actual extra credit, to my rebellious times in second grade where Charlotte Kahn and I were barred from standing next to each other in line, to third grade where I married and then soon after divorced Miss Beasley, my Harry Potter craze in fourth grade, and my concussion in fifth grade that I got from running into a fence in cross country of all sports. Even during my dramatic COVID-filled days in middle school, my memories of the collegiate community will stay with me for life. From all the highs and lows of my years at Collegiate, I can speak from experience when I say, to the freshmen, you are at the beginning of what will be an adventurous four years. The future may seem cloudy, but you are still at a point in time where you get to dance in the breeze of whatever rainy days may come. To the sophomores, maybe it's beginning to sprinkle. Remember that what you are doing right now is important for your future self, but you've still not hit the rain of junior year. With the time you have, be playful and pursue your passions. To the juniors, now may seem like the rain won't ever stop, but I promise it won't last forever. Don't forget to take time to go jump in a puddle. Enjoy the time you have left in the collegiate community. Finally, to the seniors. It's hard to believe we are already in the second semester of our senior year. The time has definitely flown by, and we are approaching our rainbow. As we get ready to go to college, let's enjoy the time we have left together. We've been through a lot, and although the prospect of college may seem overwhelming, I'm confident that we can do it and find our new communities wherever we find our new homes. Thank you. Our third speaker today is Brooks Barnum. Brooks will be introduced by her brother, Kiefer. Hey everyone, uh, somehow Brooks trusted me not to embarrass her up here, but there are worse things she has than me, so I'll just say uh, it's very exciting to be here with everyone today. Um, as her older brother, I have obviously known Brooks her entire life. Some of you have known her for a couple years, some of her maybe longer, so I'll answer the question maybe everyone's wondering. Yes, Brooks has always had a brilliant mind, she's always been talented, and she's always had a thoughtful and caring soul. Except for maybe that one time when her kindergarten teacher was concerned about her hoarding all the snacks, protecting them with her whole body. <laughs> Likely because her two hungry brothers ate everything in the pantry. Um, she got nothing left or, you know, growing up with two brothers may have been, you know, who played sports may have been a little dicey. She came home with bumps and bruises very often. You know, at five years old, she was winging down the soccer uh, field, arms sprawled, tackling people in her way. It's not really how you play soccer, but that was kind of her style. <laughs> um, I'd like to think of her physical playing, playing style, um, or maybe her interest in sports coming from us, but surely not. Brooks has always had a natural curiosity about her, and she's never afraid to ask questions. Whether it's questions about buffingos, AKA flamingos when she was younger, <laughs> or, how to cook an old Italian Melillo family recipe, or how to play guitar. She's always seeking knowledge and growing, and I admire her for that. When she puts her mind to something, she gets it done. 
This is why when I came home from my first semester of college as an alleged guitar player, she taught me how to play a diminished chord, <laughs> which sparked me to want to practice more, be more like Brooks. I believe she installs uh, instills uh, confidence in others. She's not overly complimentary, but when a compliment is due, she'll make it known. She has a very witty sense of humor and a very good friend. She's a very engaged member of the Louisville community, volunteering hours, an ambassador for the International Conference of Human Trafficking, and a representative of the Flight Club. And maybe most importantly to me, she's my sister, but more importantly, she's an individual who will continue to positively impact others around her for a very, very long time. The youngest child in the family maybe sometimes comes with stereotypes, but Brooks is in fact a leader. And I'm sure y'all could tell me more about that than I could, so I'd like to introduce your class president, my sister Brooks. Until the ripe age of 12, I had a grave fear of accidentally getting burned. Beach bonfires, birthday cakes, sparklers, easy bake ovens, real ovens, you name it, I kept a calculated distance. In middle school, my growing love for cheap, nauseating candles began to out overshadow my distaste for open flames. I ran into a bit of a problem. At the time, the Barnums were a big match household, so those are what I had to work with. Blood, sweat, and many, many tears went into the process of my mom teaching me how to light a match, and I soon realized that the best way to approach the situation was quickly and with confidence. The longer I held onto the match without lighting the candle, the higher the likelihood was of A, the flame going out and the match being wasted, or B, unintentionally burning myself. Historically, I've usually been one to take as much time as I need to think things through and been thoughtful, but lighting fire does not afford that luxury. And by learning to light matches, I soon realized that sometimes you really and truly have to dive in head first without thinking it over all that much, or you will miss out on your opportunity. In time-sensitive situations, I've never regretted taping, taking a leap of faith, even if the outcome wasn't necessarily pretty. I'd love to share how such instances, swapping physical danger for public humiliation, have played out in my life. In middle school, I attended Wee Day, where I watched the performance of a lifetime by a seasoned beatboxing champion. Naturally, post-ceremony, my class decided that it would be opportune to show off our own beatboxing abilities, and a few of my friends convinced me that I had some potential. Yikes. Ironically enough, that same year at summer camp, one step of the cabin scavenger hunt involved beatboxing a counselor. I had faith in my abilities and ultimately won the battle. This counselor, who called himself Sea Bass, applauded me, jokingly demanding a rematch. The last day of camp, each cabin was to perform a skit they created for all of the camp to see. Marie Wilson saw that opportunity and campaigned among my cabin mates that the skit be centered around me, and only me, rematching Seabass publicly. I beatboxed my little heart out, only to be annihilated by my competition. The entire camp cheered their praises for Seabass, and I was left a failure. At this point, I very well could have ended my beatboxing career, but instead the loss only fueled my desire to improve. I took the perceived failure as a challenge, and as a result, my skills have flourished in recent years now more than ever. Although this hobby is incredibly foolish, and I don't actually believe I'm talented, when asked to beatbox or more recently freestyle, I will rarely back down. Embracing a last minute opportunity and being humbled was a surprisingly effective catalyst for enjoying a silly hobby. I will no longer wonder what may have been had I just gone out on a limb and performed for a robust audience. Putting yourself in positions to be embarrassed is actually pretty fun, and there are rarely high stakes except for maybe a bruised ego. And truthfully, nobody thinks about your embarrassing moments more than you do. If you dive in without overthinking the consequences, you may stumble upon an opportunity you will not regret taking. Also in middle school, I joined a ukulele performance group very profoundly called the Yuka Yeyes, and for our Christmas special, rebranded as the Yuletide Ukes. We were a newbie group, but were invited to play the outside the doors of a small charity event during the holiday season. We were halfway decent, but were summoned to promote the event live on the morning news, which was a tall task for budding talent. I practiced incessantly and felt well prepared for our big break. When our time came to perform, we were in good shape. Lined up and matching Christmas neck bandanas that our parents forced us to wear, we played Jingle Bells to a T. 
However, disaster quickly struck. My anxiety caused me to space out while reading the music. I lost sight of the proper chords to accompany the one horse open sleigh in question, and my hand came to an abrupt stop as I frantically attempted to find my place again and rejoin the group. During this brief pause, the camera conveniently panned over and zoomed in on my frozen hand, showcasing my lapse in playing for all those who cared to tune in. Fortunately, I was unaware of this while, until watching the recording back after the broadcast, but I felt humiliated. I had some fun poked at me, but my music career wasn't permanently stunted, and I still play ukulele now, even, even dabble in guitar. Again, I have found it better to use embarrassment as fuel because it's probably more embarrassing to just give up. Whether it be beatboxing for your summer camp or playing ukulele on the news, there will never be a perfect time for anything. So if you're thinking about trying something new, you should probably just go for it, within reason. Tori occasionally likes to reiterate that embarrassment is a choice. I'm fully supportive of that notion. Although having the confidence to overlook mess ups is an ongoing process, there is something to be said about fake it until you make it. The longer you go on faking confidence, the more it grows on you and one day it will just be real confidence. Don't overthink possible opportunities too much, be a bit spontaneous, and accept that the worst possible outcome is likely just embarrassing yourself, which will ultimately make a great story anyways. Light that match while you're still able. Thank you.